And Jesus sat down and he began to teach them, saying, In the book of uh, Isaiah, chapter 38, we find an interesting story the story of uh, Hezekiah. I prepared a full meal for us today, a big feast for us to eat as much as we can, sharing the greater parts of the Bible. So you're going to be flying through your Bible, I'll be flying through my mind. And uh, we hope we'll find each other towards the end of the sermon. The sickness of Hezekiah, king of, um, king of Judah, uh, results in him facing the wall and praying and seeking for an extension of his days. Someone say amen or damn. When God gives you a sentence, you can always negotiate. Never sit down and settle for what life gives you. Heaven is open for negotiation. And Hezekiah negotiated an extra 15 years. And after he negotiated for 15 years, then the prophet comes back and says to him, actually, you're healing. There's a fig tree outside of your house. They took the leaves of the fig tree and squeezed him on his wounds and the wounds healed. Ladies and gentlemen, the solutions you're looking for are not in the sky. They are just outside your yard. God places your resources not far from where you are. Look behind you. There is a lamb that I had prepared. Please spare your son. And kill what I have given you. For the name El Shaddai means when you get to the mountain of the Lord, the blessings you are seeking for will be waiting for you there. Then the watchers and the watchers of Babylon are watching this great mystery that has happened. For in my tribe we have something we call Mzilankata. These guys who put on this black thing around their heads. They are watchers of time. Then you find the men sitting by the sea with one pole this side, one pole this side, and he's sitting between them looking at the moon. The European looks at him and says, this man is worshipping the moon. No, he's not worshipping the moon. He's watching the moon to see which direction it is going and which seasons are coming and what sort of seasons are coming together with the movement of the moon. Therefore, when they were watching these Babylonians looking at their sun, we grew up doing that. Of course, we did not have many watches. I think I got my first watch way after, way after college. You know, then you, what you do is that you put a pole here. When the sun is coming out, the shadow is very far. Then you know what time it is. As the sun is moving, then you peg and you peg and you peg. And at midday, you and your shadow are the same height. Then you know it's 12 o'clock. You know, so the Babylonians are watching these times. Ish. We can go back to the book of Genesis again and hear about the sons of Abraham when Abraham says, my son will not share the inheritance with the sons of Keturah. He gave them gold, he gave them Myra, he gave them frankincense and he sent them to the east. The next time we see people coming from the east, it is at the birth of the Messiah. So maybe they brought back what their grandfather gave them as if to claim back the inheritance that they were sent away not to inherit together with the son who had been born Isaac. So they were watching the sun and as the sun moves from the prayer of Hezekiah who had said, please Lord, I don't believe that you have healed me. Can you give me a sign? Never force yourself to believe what you don't believe. Heaven gives you a chance to proofread what you think you want to believe. Don't force other people to believe what you believe. Hezekiah did not believe. He says, I want a sign. Leave us also who belong to the gospel of Thomas. To say, until I touch his hands, I don't believe that he is risen. Gideon also says, if you want me to go, please, put fleece this side and put snow this side and clean it up. And You know, it's a whole big chapter of playing games with God. So don't be forced to believe what you don't believe. There is room for divine intervention to proofread to you that which you believe. The Babylonians are looking at their sun and watches, turning upside down. Babylon sends emissaries around the world to go and look at what has happened. Alas, praise the Lord, they came to the house of Hezekiah. When they arrive at the house of Hezekiah, Hezekiah is excited to see guests from far. He shows them the gold, underline that part, chapter 38 of Isaiah. Shows them the gold, shows them the silver, shows them the ammunition of Israel, shows them the temple. Shows them the holy utensils. Shows them the school of the prophets, which was in the temple. Shows them all the goodies of Babylon. And the Babylonians were happy and they walked out of Hezekiah's house. As they are walking out of Hezekiah's house, Isaiah walks back into the, pal into the palace of the king. With one question and one question only. What have they seen in your house? They came here looking for a sign 
that the son had been turned backwards and that God had answered your prayer. Instead of you telling them, I prayed, I asked God to move the son backwards. Instead of praising the Lord for what he has done to you, you decide to, to gloat and display the opulence of your own wealth, the refinement of your own ammunition, the reserves of your own gold, and gloat about the glory of your temple. What have they seen in your house? And for all the young people in the house and the married and the rich and the famous, that which you show them, that's what they come to collect. You didn't hear me out there. I feel like preaching in this place. That which you show them, that's what they're coming to collect. You will not appreciate Daniel chapter 1 until you understand this precursor right here. The Babylonians came seeking for the miracles of God. Hezekiah was too consumed in his own wealth and forgot to tell them what God has done. Instead, he went material. Then the Babylonians started planning for war. Chapter 1 of the book of Daniel. And they came and besieged the city of Jerusalem. Spare me the details. After they besieged them, Jerusalem gave in. Jehoiakim, king of Judah, was handed over into the hands of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. Enjoy the rest of the passage. And when they captured them, they went into Jerusalem. Ha! Ah, they went to the temple. They collected the gold. They collected the silver. They collected the holy vessels. They went underneath in the schools of the prophet. They collected the finest from the school. They collected everything that had to do with their own gods of the Israelites and moved it to the temple of his own god, Marduk, back in Babylon. Now take note Careful, careful. This war is not about materials. It's a war of gods. You didn't hear me out there? It's a war of gods. Because if your God is weaker than mine, then my God overpowers yours. And when we conquer a king, we conquer their God. Just remember one thing next time you're fighting, that you're not fighting for yourself. You're fighting for that which protects you. And when you expose yourself to weakness, you have just sold the essence of your very God. Then the God of the Israelites was captured together with his people. Take note. I once preached this sermon the other day and I got excited. What do you do when your God hands you over to your enemies? Who will protect you from, the, from your own God? Who has handed you over to your enemies so that they can fix you? So let's look at the colonial project from the aspect of the book of Daniel chapter 1. Firstly, when you colonize a people, Eurocentric religion coming to Africa, when you colonize a people, number one, besiege them, surround them. Maybe that talks to our borders. Confine them within a certain space of limitation so that those that are outside cannot come in and those that are inside cannot go outside. Reduce the amount of resources and information that they receive. The other day I heard someone from South Africa saying I'm going to Africa. <laughs> then I knew that South Africa, especially South Africa, is not part of Africa. Because in the midst of the apartheid regime, you were closed away from the rest of the world. That's how you colonize the people. Limit them within certain boundaries. And after limiting them within certain boundaries, number one, Colonize them by changing their God. Are you with me? Move them from the God they know. Introduce them to the God that they don't know. Not only that, colonize them. Change their names. My name is no longer Nompumele. My name is now Mercy. I'm now Sharon. I'm now Frank. You are no longer Nomtandas. You cannot be called Mandla and Kos. You are now Franklin. <laughs> Change their names. There is power when a colonizer manages to name that which he has colonized. Because when you call a name, you evoke a spirit that goes with that name. You are calling to the essence of character and destiny that is embedded in that name. Hence, every time when they say, Joshua, I go, Amen. Present teacher, I am here. 
Because there is something that is in my name that is not in your name. And when they say, Joshua, I will stand up, the rest of you can sit down. Because that is specifically addressing me. How do you colonize people? By changing their names. It's no longer Mkumbane. It's now called Katoridge. It's no longer Emma Dadden. It's now Lady Smith. It's no longer a Gauteng. It's now Johannesburg. It's no longer what what. It's now Free State. It's no longer this mountain, Drakensberg. It's now this. It's now this. Colonize something, change it, and name it after yourself. No wonder the Europeans are so comfortable in Africa because you can actually find Essex in South Africa. Yes, Essex in South Africa. Right here. You find, Lou, you find uh, British suburbs here. Victoria Falls, Mosi Atunya. There is a man who discovered Victoria Falls. To hell with you. How do you discover, how do you discover what we already know? Maybe the next time I, I go to London, I'm, go, I'm going to become the most humorous of them all. I want to put a status when I land in London that uh, I have discovered. I've discovered a city next to the river. Let's call the river, let's call the river Mkumbane. I see strange people here with funny nose and they walk around like mobile wardrobes. I want to call this city Kwashimba. And let me see what Europe will do when I walk into their country and I name it after myself. Then you understand the arrogance of colonialism. Change their names. Not only change their names, change their fashion. Hello, somebody? Change their fashion. Take away from them that which they can identify with. Make them look like the other. Just when you thought you got it all. Change their diet. Huh? Am I talking to Africans here? Please. I don't just like my salad. I want you to feta cheese and some olives, please, and, uh, and some Greek dressing. Please uh, make it uh, the Italian dressing. Ha! Ufundeni nama kekings wena nama olives. Usi so wase kumbunje. Ufundeni nukuchama olives. When? But you can know that you can capture the appetite of the colonized. Because remember, colonization project works when the colonized support the colonial project. So you colonize their God, colonize their geography, colonize their names, colonize their diet, colonize their fashion. Your name will no longer be Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Now you're going to be called Belshazzar, uh, Meshach, and Abednego. Because you want to move the essence of control from their own God to your own God. Take note, not only that, colonize their education. Huh? Teach them the Babylonian things. Take away the literature of Jerusalem. Introduce to them a new curriculum. The curriculum of Babylon. Read it. It's in there in Daniel chapter 1. Introduce them to the literature of the Babylonians and teach them. And here we are as Africans. We know far much more about Vasco da Gama. Far much more about Moffat. Far much more about Van Riebeck. We know so much more. David Livingstone, Cecil John Rhodes. And little, if nothing at all, about ourselves. So we take our children and take them to crash for the first two, three years. Colonize their, their world view. Take them away from the African fairy tales. Introduce them to Caspar the Friendly Ghost. <laughs> Show them Mickey Mouse. Create a different world view of fairy tales, of babies. White Caucasians represent purity. So that the children will begin to idolize and love white dolls. When they grow up, they will look like the pictures they enjoyed when they were young. The colonized possession project is real. Because it only does not tamper with external issues. It tempers with the very software of the human civilization. Particularly the black African. Whose world view, when he looks, when she looks in the mirror, can no longer look at themselves. They look at what they want them to look like. To colonize the education. Take them to primary school. Talks them. Pump them. Teach them 
How many legs does a grasshopper have? Teach them about Bilhazia. Teach them all the, the stuff. You tell me right now, what do you, what, how much money can you make from knowing how many legs does a grasshopper have? <laughs> the Bantu education is not intended for the African to own anything. It is built for the African to work for something. And to work for something. So here we are, all of us seeming educated. And at the graduation of all our colleges, the first thing that we are looking for is a CV. Looking for a job to go and work for Umlung. The whole educated graduate with a master's magma summa cum laude behind their back. They actually did a research on water reticulation for their masters and how to process and develop the environment in terms of creating water reserves. And they are looking for a job. And the same country they are living in is a problem of water. Engineers who now know how to make electricity, they are looking for a job. When ESCOM has a problem of load shading phase four, like some of us, of course, in terms of complexion. But why would you look for a job when you are now qualified to offer the solution? Because in all your training, you were never trained how to open up a company. When you go to Cypro, there's someone who never went to high school. He's the one who's going to register the company for you. They can't even speak correct English. And the whole doctor, in all his dissertations, was never introduced to the system. How to open up a company and how to return taxes. We are put into columns. Accountants this side, developers this side, engineers that side, and what, what that side. And we come out of this place of education as fragments to fit into the puzzle of the colonial project. I said educate them. And make sure that the education does not teach them to own. It teaches them to serve in the palace of the king. Ah. Did you read that part? Teach them so that they can become of service in the palace of the king. Verse 8 then throws everything to the other side. But Daniel purposed in his heart that he will not contaminate himself with the academic diet of Babylon, with the financial diet of Babylon, with the fashion diet of Babylon, with the religious diet of Babylon. Is someone with me out there? With the social engineering of Babylon. Many of us only look at the diet concept and think it was for bread and water and beans. In my own world, when you make up your mind, remove yourself from Babylon. Babylon represents an education, an economy, and entertainment and fashion of confusion. And some of us have become custodians of that colonization project. We've become supervisors to check other children who are not complying to the colonial project. And then you walk up to them. Where do you think you're going looking like this? Who dresses up like this? I do. Who talks like that? I do. Who plays music like that? I do. You got a problem with that? Go to your colonial masters and tell them that some people have now revolted. They no longer find glory in the colonial project. I purpose in my heart not to contaminate myself with the diet that the king of Babylon has prescribed. This is how you eat. This is how you dress. This is how you think. So here I am sitting with fellow Africans. The result of 400 years of the colonial project. Sitting around in a place of worship. I wonder if we worship what we know. I wonder if we call on whom we know. I wonder even if we know ourselves. I wonder if we eat what we know and we entertain ourselves with what we know. Daniel purposed in his heart. Oh, that you also may purpose in your heart. Not to contaminate yourself. Give us beans, vegetables and water. I like that part there. And they were ten times better than everybody else. There is grace that covers effort. One day of favor outshines a lifetime of labor. When God casts favor on you, ordinary things become extraordinary. That's what makes ordinary people look extraordinary. It's not for what they are putting on, but it's for the grace that covers them and extends 
the little things and make them much. The ordinary things and make them extraordinary. They were ten times better. Go and read it again in complexion. Texture of skin. Huh? They were ten times better in terms of body and health. When he looked at them, when others were, put, were pushing mini, uh, uh, pushing bellies and everything else, these fine guys were looking just sharp. They were looking just fine. But just when you thought you understood it, when you started questioning them, their, I like English, their mental ability, their mental aptitude was of a superior quality to the rest of them. Those studying the same curriculum, their answers were of a superior quality to the rest of them. You didn't hear me? Therefore, your diet influences your intellect. What you eat influences how you finally think. Therefore, do your spirituality in your diet. As you are cooking, you are cooking the health of the mind. I leave that for the mothers. Reduce sugars and toxics in the food of your children. And you may just develop better able-bodied children than these uh, prison candidates you are busy pumping in with sugar. On chapter 2 of the book of Daniel, we meet up the king dreaming of a dream which he cannot remember. Now I know why many of us keep continental pillows in our houses because those pillows are full of dreams that never see the light of day. The difference between Nebuchadnezzar and Daniel is that when Daniel sleeps, he remembers. When Nebuchadnezzar sleeps, he cannot remember. And therefore, here is the crisis part that Nebuchadnezzar was a foreigner Nebuchadnezzar was a non-believer, quote-unquote, he was a Gentile, quote-unquote, he was a Babylonian, quote-unquote, he was a pagan, according to you. But God surprises all Adventists by going to Nebuchadnezzar, the non-believer, the non-circumcised, the Gentile, and he reveals himself to the Gentile. The prophecies that Adventism is crazy about were not given to a Jew. They were given to a Gentile. Right now, if a non-Adventist would walk up here, the church body would sit. No non-Adventist addresses us at 11 o'clock. We don't take people from outside to be talking to us. Maybe go back to the book of Daniel chapter 2. That God can work. Ningam memorize utik. Ningam kremi. Ningam manage utik. It's not your project. That you must say he only works like this. He can't work like that. There's modas operandi. Common way of doing things. There's modas vivandi. Irregular way of doing things. But either way all things work together. For good for them that love the Lord. Stop putting God in the confines of your own limitations. Especially if you have a small mind. Allow God and the broadness of his mind. For as high as the heavens are above the earth. So are my ways above your ways. And of course, Nebuchadnezzar was black. In case you don't know Nebuchadnezzar, then find out who was the father of Nebuchadnezzar. It was Cush. Who was Cush? He was the son of Ham. Who was Ham? The father of the black people. The son of Noah. Son of Lamech. Son of Methuselah. Son of Noah. Son of God. Oh, now we know that Nebuchadnezzar, he's a black man who was given a vision. And Abraham was called from heir of the Chaldees from the Babylonian kingdom also. That's for another day. Abra, his name was Abram, until he met God. And he says, your name is no longer Abram. You are now Abra, Desh, Ham. Do I have academicians in the house? You were Abram. Now I said Ham is the father of Cush, who is the father of the black people. And when God gives him a name, he says, now you are Abra, Ham, now you are the father of Ham. So this thing is not as foreign as we think maybe it is. Maybe actually this thing is named after us. When we say we are sons of Abraham, maybe in that context therefore, we need to claim the entire estate of the biblical space and assume our positions for we are the Hamites, the sons of Ham, who are now having Abraham as the father of faith. 
Do I still have you in the house? Dreams a dream, dream of gold, dream of silver, brass and etc. Traditional interpretations. Let's put them on the left as you already know them. Let's get to some certain meat. Life is getting cheaper and cheaper by the day. From the gold that you once were, if you now reduced yourself to silver, if you now become brass, if you now become iron, very soon I'll be called to bury you dust to dust. For everything goes back where it started. In the golden years of your thinking, please keep your thoughts pure as refined gold. Make your principles and secure them like silver. Keep your morality in the space of brass and be upright and true. Work hard for that which you believe. For sooner or later life will powder you into dust. You may not be remembered. But when you become dust, we hope that the stone will be standing on top of your life to create a new life for the rest of them that will come after you. Someone with me out there? Just when you thought you understood it, maybe that's what the colonial project was all about. Go to Africa, collect the gold. Ha <laughs> ha, collect the silver. Collect the brass, collect the iron. And just leave them with the dust. Just when you thought you understood it, maybe the prophecy of Daniel actually has to do with the development of our economies. The development of our politics. The finest hour of all politics was Babylon. Ask me why. Ask me why. Babylon and Nebuchadnezzar was the most educated of all presidents. In his parliament, he did not have a parliament of monkeys and buffoons who all say, yes, sir, viva, 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 Amandla, Amandla, I'm away to Amandla. No, Nebuchadnezzar was more intelligent than all of us put together. In his parliament, he did not have fellow political sympathizers. 60% ANC, 20%, 2%, 3%, IFP, EFF, DA, and what? No, Nebuchadnezzar was of a different brand. He sits on his chair as a king and he says, please put me which doctors? On the left. Bring me mathematicians. Bring me necromancers. Those who read the stars, astrologers. Shalani Pans, Madut. Shalani Pans. Those who read palms. And all the sciences. So when he is consulting, Nebuchadnezzar says, okay, we want to build a road. It in witchcraft. It in science. It in astrology. Nina infundi zanjala. It in ziti ni zanjala. Ziti ni zinyanya na matongo. What are the clouds? So, so that in the midst of him consulting, he consulted widely. And I think that what, why God says, Nebuchadnezzar, you are the head of gold. The best of all thinking that we can think about. Babylonian remains the best of them all. No one in all our presidents put together has been able to reach that excellency of intellectual capacity to contain in one room such a diverse, plural concept Nebuchadnezzar did not have a university. He had a mild tie varsity. Uni speaks to one corridor of thinking, the Western school of thought. Multi speaks to multiple views of world view. Christians, what do you say? Traditional people, what do you say? Hindus, what do you say? Buddhists, what do you say? Consolidate all that together and come up with an opinion. Then you are a president representing the nation. That is the strength of the mind. And from Babylon, Medopasia, with their rules and regulation, governance. How do we write our rules? Once we write our rules, let's not change them, even if they are evil. No wonder we are struggling in South Africa. I watched your sauna and my heart was upset and I almost puked when I saw a bunch of African people marching with some small little stupid trumpets. Well, right, left, right, left. Of all that killed me, then I heard some Spanish, Scottish pipes. Whatever melody was being played there, only the Scott people will understand. And as I was watching, I said, the entire South African community with 13 various tribes, 
none of our tribes could cut it. We are still at that level of 17th, 18th century. Where to celebrate our own parliament, state of the nation address. We are fully in the 1800s. Marching following a certain stick, only the devil knows what it represents. I said, when you colonize them, pollute them to such an extent that by the time they are doing, they can no longer remember themselves. And here we are as Africa, deteriorating from the gold that we once had. Mapungubwe is known for gold. Zimbabwe is known for gold. Colonization was a result of our own materials. But from the materials that we had, look at us now. Enjoy the passage as we skip over into chapter 3. Chapter 3, he is sitting by himself and he says, I don't want to die. I want to last forever. Chapter 2, I was told, you are only the head of gold. Chapter 3 says, I will make everything out of gold. I will allow the Babylonian influence to filter through the corridors of time to eternity. Who has not been affected by the Babylonian system? Here we are, sitting by the plain of Dura as Africans. Being forced to worship this golden image of economics. World is no longer about morality. It's now about the golden image in the plain of Dura. Where African countries must now bow. If you don't bow, we'll put you in sanctions. I've good news for you. This very same image, you will not appreciate it until then you read in the book of Revelation, chapter 13. And then you find the images of chapter 13. That which looked like a lion, but he was walking like a leopard. And he had thought, looks also of a bear. Chapter 7 then confirms of the book of Daniel. Then Babylon, it is the kingdom of gold and the lion. Followed by Medopasia, which is the bear. And then the leopards. And then the beast itself. The beast of chapter 13 of the book of Revelation is the image of chapter 3. Are we getting somewhere? Is the very same image. For the conclusion of chapter 13 says, no one can trade, buy, or sell unless they worship this beast, which is actually the economic beast that we are talking about. I've always rattled and made noise on social media. Some of you might think that I'm losing my mind. They talk about the global village. I only have one question. So who will be the chief and the king in that village? And what will Africa be in that village? And unless we think correctly, we are being transported to that village as slaves and servants in that village again. But good news for Africa, while we are in this fairness being cooked through various financial policies, the fourth man appears with us. Ha! Huh. Come on, someone can say amen out there. The fourth man appears with us to protect us from this very same fire that we are being burned from. Nebuchadnezzar and his arrogance, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, please come forward. And he looks at the other side. He says, I see another man. He looks like the fourth man. And he looks like the son of God. In one of my old sermons, of course, yes. Why did Nebuchadnezzar not invite the fourth man out of the furnace? Maybe the passage would have changed. The fourth man came out and worship began. Even Nebuchadnezzar fell off his chair. And they all worshipped the fourth man who walked out of the furnace. But now I know the human element. People are afraid of inviting that which is bigger than themselves. By the time we get to chapter 4, Nebuchadnezzar's software has improved. He used to dream and forget. Now he dreams and remembers. Now he dreams. There is an angel shouting from the heavens to a big tree planted in the felt. Cut the tree and leave the stump. Take a brass bangle and put it around the stump of the tree, representing the times of refreshment. For I cut it for a while, it will germinate again. For the good preachers take the cutting of the stump combined with the book of Judges, the cutting of Samson's hair, parallel the two together, enjoy a good sermon out there. Cut the hair, but they forgot to cut it again. For it germinated and he said, may I please lean on the pillars. Aha. Nebuchadnezzar cut the tree, 
but leave it. I'm glad that God has never uprooted any one of us. We are all cut to pieces, but thank the Lord, grace uh -huh, leaves the stump in the ground. Therefore, be patient with others who seem to have lost their branches. Can I preach a little bit? Be patient with others when the birds have flown away from their branches. Be patient with others when they seem to be lying on the ground and being turned into manure. Look very carefully. You will see that next to their tree, there is a brass bird entangled on the root of the tree. When the seasons of refreshment come, oh yes, it will bud, it will shoot again. Seasons of grace, the patience of grace to give us another opportunity. Whether it is divorce, it is bankruptcy, don't worry. The Lord cuts even kings also, but they will germinate again. Never consider your branches as your success. Consider your roots as your establishment. Come on. Someone say amen out there. These things can fall away, but be sustainable. Now I hear like a song saying, will you anchor hold in the times of the storm? We have an anchor that thrills the soul. Oh, we used to sing when we were young men, fasten to the rock. It can't be moved, grounded, firm and deep in the Savior's love. May I ask a question? When the acts of judgment comes, how deep are your roots? How deep are your foundation? Will you last a moment after the pride of your home and children and husband has disappeared? I say when the Lord cuts you down, stay on the ground. Remember, there's a brass belt around your waist. Wait for the seasons of refreshment. The beast eats grass like a cow. I like that one there. Until one morning, he says, and I looked up and my sanity was returned to me. Aha, uh -huh. when only when you look up will sanity be returned to you. By the time we get to chapter 5, then we understand Isaiah chapter 38. For Belshazzar, who had been named after Daniel Belshazzar, the grandfather Nebuchadnezzar thought that Belshazzar, the grandson, will be as smart as Belshazzar Daniel. So he named his own grandson Belshazzar, hoping that by osmosis, Perchance by osmo regulation and association or diffusion. Somehow, somewhere, by putting a more noble name of a man who had demonstrated power and wisdom. Take this name and give it to your child. It's never too late to give your children names of wisdom and intelligence. Maybe, just maybe, even if they are stupid, at least let them carry a good name. May just remind them of who they are. But Belshazzar, at the peak of his mischief, says, please bring me back those utensils and let us eat and drink from them in front of his concubines and, every, and he started drinking from them. I like that one also. And then God visited the party uninvited. Two guests were not invited. It was the grandmother of Belshazzar and Daniel. For only then do we hear that they were called in. But the passage, it said all of them were invited. So don't always be part of the all. Oh, another day we'll preach on that one, yeah? You can also be exempted from certain places. And you can only be called upon when it is due and it is necessary. The grandmother comes and gives the grandson a lecture. Your grandfather was arrogant, rude, just like you. Constipated with success until God cut him to the ground, released the entire history. But you have not humbled yourself. Call Daniel, he'll come and tell you what has happened. I will make him the third in the kingdom. Now I know he was not even in power. Because if you're in power, you're going to make him the second. But he was going to make him the third because his father was still alive. So don't abuse authority. You're not the final word. He takes off the gold, takes off the gown, and puts it on him. While he's dressing him up, the Middle Persians broke through the barriers of Babylon, sneaked into the night into the city of Babylon, rushed up to the temples where the party was taking place for the entire city was silent, except the noise was coming from this palace. When they went in, they, they butchered everybody. But as tradition has it, please don't kill the king. And the only thing they knew, there's a king in Babylon. And when you know the king, Look at his head. You find him with a crown. Look on his neck. 
you find him with a, with, a, with a chain, he will have royal robes on him. In case you have forgotten, ask his name. His name is Belshazzar. Let's go back to chapter 1. And Nebuchadnezzar named him, not Daniel. Decided to name him Belshazzar. And named his grandson Belshazzar. Coincidence? Two Belshazzars standing on one stage. One trousers was full of human manure. The other one, he had a crown on his head, a chain on his neck, and royal gowns on. Who is Belshazzar? To which they were told, the one dressed up like a king is Belshazzar. Daniel is spared in the midst of the slaughter because he happened just to have been prepared before the storm. Now, some of these names you give us when we are still in trouble, they come in handy. They were joking when they called me bishop when I was young, you know. They did not know. That that which you may have considered to be a disadvantage, God turns it for grace. I think my time is up, actually. Mama Ruti, is, she always tries to manage me. She's been going like this for the past five minutes. When God gives you grace, you don't have a season. You can outlive seasons. There is Babylon. It comes and goes. You are a person of responsibility. Medopatia comes. You are still a person of responsibility. Don't build your reputation around political circles which expire. Don't have friends who run out of fashion. Correct alignment means that even when systems change, grace carries you on to the next level. I won't have time for chapter 6. In positions of power, stay away from corruption. Stay away from evil. For they will seek for you there. I won't have time to talk about pray looking in the right direction. Your God will hear you when you pray. I won't have time for chapter 7. The combinations of the beast. Chapter 8, cleanse your sanctuary. Keep it clean all the time. Chapter 9, pray. Ask for forgiveness of the past. Because that's when God was angry. Then you can deal with your present and your future. We have sinned and our fathers. Please forgive our ancestors for what they have done. Only when God had addressed God, when Daniel had addressed God in the past, then he says, please hear our prayers and answer us. While he was still on his knees, an angel stood by him and said, I've come to tell you that you are greatly beloved and I've brought answers for you. Ah. Good message there. Some prayers you're not going to say amen. For grace comes to answer before you say amen. amen. Kings will come from the east and from the west and the north. Be of good cheer on chapter 12. Be established. I like chapter 12 as we're concluding. And at that time of the great confusion and chaos when others are cleansing their sanctuaries and everything else. Michael, the great archangel. I know Michael. I've read some in Matthew about Gabriel. Then I read in the book of... Uh, in the book of Enoch, I found the Uriel and Raphael, the four angels that are holding the four corners of the world. But on chapter 12, then Michael, the great archangel. I know Adventists want to make Michael Jesus. Let's leave that for Sabbath school lessons. But the Bible says he is an angel who stands up with healing in his wings. Thousands who lie in the dust of the earth. Some will be raised to everlasting life. Some to everlasting contempt. Now come back to chapter verse 9, 8 and somewhere there. 4, 5, 6 and 7. And many of the righteous will purify themselves. That's again on chapter 8. And make themselves blameless. That's chapter 1 verse 8 of Daniel. Purpose in your heart to separate yourself. Purify themselves and make themselves spotless. But the wicked will continuously be wicked. And none of the wicked will understand. But the righteous shall shine like the stars of the morning. And the last verse in the book of Daniel. But as for you, Daniel, go your way and die. Join your forefathers. You shall receive your rewards at the allotted time. Now go to the book of Hebrews chapter 11. And all these died in faith. They did not receive their rewards thereof. For God had purposed that together with us, their rewards might be made perfect. What more shall we say? For time will not allow us to talk about all the patriarchs of old who gave their children to be bent. Some of them bent on the stakes. Some of them cut in half because they believed that God had something better in store together with us. Chapter 12 of the book of Hebrews then concludes the story. We are therefore surrounded by a cloud of witnesses. Let's put aside 
all the colonial things that easily entice us. All the weights that entice us. But looking up to the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross despising the shame. Oh, that may the Lord bless us and grant us the blessing as we live from day to day when we face our furnaces. There is a fourth man. May the Lord bring to remembrance the dreams that we dream or that we may all have a purpose in our hearts not to contaminate ourselves with the system of Babylon. Amen. Thank you, Mkundisi. Um, can we do the closing song, number 100, first and last stanza? May the church stand as we sing number 100. Oh! 